Father, we're humbled as we come to this moment, as we sit in this room, as we sit under your word, as we yield to its teachings and the power of the Holy Spirit. We're humbled that you know us completely. There's nothing hidden from you. You know our comings and our goings and our thoughts and our words. You know our attitudes. You know the motivations of our heart. Um, and yet, yet you love us, which is an amazing love. To be known completely and, and loved absolutely is an amazing thing. And so, Father, as we hear your word to us today, may we hear it in that spirit, the spirit of he who knows us best, loves us most, desires that we would have life, life to the full, not life in, in bondage, but life that is glorifying to you, satisfying to us, and preparing us for everlasting glory. And so, Father, I pray you cause these words just to speak, and you grab our hearts, capture our thoughts, show us your will, reveal yourself to us today, and be glorified in our response. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Something has, has changed in Christianity over the centuries, and the change is not a subtle one. Because the era of Christianity is now two millennia old, sometimes I think maybe we don't see the, the arc of change very clearly. But I often wonder when I'm listening to a message that I might catch online or something I'll see on television or pick up a new book at the bookstore just to see what the latest popular Christian author is saying, I often wonder... What would our spiritual forebears think if they read this? What would, what would those early Christian leaders think if they sat in a modern American church today hearing the sort of things that are taught and expressed and espoused? I, I, I dare, dare say they wouldn't think this is just a little bit different. The flavor is just a little bit different. The style is a little bit different. I think in many cases they would say this is a different gospel. How did we get so far? How, how do we move so far afield? Um, and the changes are, are so deep that they affect our, our view of God. Who, who is God really? What does God expect from us, demand from us, and what right does God have over us? Our, our view of ourselves, who are we? What is our life about? What are we supposed to be here for? What are we supposed to be doing? To whom are we accountable? And because those two issues are so critical, then what is the gospel? What is God offering us? What has he done for us in Christ? And what are we supposed to do as a result of that? All these things hang in the balance. I want you to consider how some past Christians thought about their relationship to Jesus. Polycarp, a bishop in the first century, wrote this in a letter. He said, for you know that you've been saved by a gracious gift, not from works, but by the will of God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, Bind up your loose robes and serve as God's slaves in reverential fear and truth, abandoning futile reasoning and the error that deceives many, and believing in the one who raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead and gave him glory and a throne at his right hand. Everything in heaven and on earth is subject to him. Everything that breathes will serve him. He's coming as a judge of the living and the dead, and God will hold those who disobey him accountable for his blood. Or Augustine, the fourth century. Does your Lord not deserve to have you as his trustworthy slave. Or in a more modern era, Scottish preacher Alexander McLaren in the 19th century wrote this. He said, the true position then for a man is to be God's slave. The harsh, repellent features of that wicked institution assume an altogether different character when they become the features of my relation to him. Absolute submission, unconditional obedience on the slave's part, and on the part of the master, complete ownership, the right of life and death, the right of disposing all goods, the right of separating husband, wife, parents, children, the right of issuing commands without a reason, the right to expect that those commandments shall be swiftly, unhesitatingly, punctiliously, and completely performed. These things are inherent in our relation to God. Blessed is the man who has learned that they do and has accepted them as his highest glory and the security of his most blessed life. For brothers, such submission, absolute and unconditional, the blending and the absorption of my own will into his will, that's the secret that makes manhood glorious and great and happy. And if you compare that to the sort of teaching you might hear today, you'll see the stark contrast. Here's something Benny Hinn said in a sermon. 
When you say I'm saved, what are you saying? You're saying I'm a Christian. What does that word mean? It means that I'm anointed. Do you know what anointed means? It means Christ. When you say I'm a Christian, you're saying I'm a little Messiah walking on the earth, in other words. That's a shocking revelation. We do not have a part of him running around in our stomachs causing goosebumps. The new man is after God, like God, God God-like, complete in Christ Jesus. The new creation is just like God. May I say it like this? You are a little God on earth running around. Kenneth Copeland. God is a spirit, and Jesus said the time will come, and now the time is that they who worship him will worship him in spirit and truth. And he imparted in you when you were born again. Peter said it just as plain. He said we are partakers of the divine nature. That nature is life eternal and absolute perfection. And that was imparted, injected into your spirit, man, and you have injected into your spirit, man, and have, you have that imparted into you by God just as, the same as you were imparted into your child, the nature of humanity. That child wasn't born a whale. He was born a human. Isn't that true? Well, now you don't have a human, do you? No, you are one. You don't have a God in you. You are one. And that sort of theology creates so many other aberrant theologies. A God not to be served, but a God who serves. A God that we don't plead with and bring our prayers and supplications to in humility, but a God we make demands of. Commands over. Give our expectations to. And those are just two egregious examples. Uh, That doesn't even begin to touch the thousands of lesser-known pastors, teachers all over the planet who are preaching a gospel that's far less than true gospel. Seemingly innocuous in their teaching. Pastors, teachers, leaders teaching a man-centered doctrine that denies God's authority, God's sovereignty, and elevates man to the position of dominance and control. Or those who teach an incapable gospel of self-help, personal gain, forgiveness without repentance, life without dying to self, or even Jesus as your friend, Jesus as your companion, Jesus as your helper, Jesus as your coach, Jesus as your lover, but not Jesus as your master. And it begs the question, and I say all this to set up this question, is it possible, per the scriptures, when we get the warning of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, that there'll be many who will say to me on the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, they'll call him master, master, because that's what Lord means. They'll say to me, master, master, and I'll say, depart from me, I don't know you, I never knew you. Is it possible in the culture that we live that so many have misunderstood what it means to really follow Christ, that it's not just a difference in denominational understanding, it's not just a difference in opinion or preference, it's a difference between saved and lost. And what does it mean to really, really follow Christ? With that in mind, I want you to open to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and we're going to start in verse 17 today. If you've got your Bible, open it there with us. There are also Bibles in the, in the chair racks, the pew racks there in front of you. If you're new to us at Calvary today, you may think this is an odd place to start with a message. Well, we're continuing through 1 Corinthians, and so every verse counts, and every word matters, and so we're going to look at these verses as they come. And so it brings us to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, which says some interesting things, and I I hope that you'll see one glaring truth that will have profound impact on you today. One glaring truth that might challenge your thinking, might confront your reality, I pray it'll even change your life. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 17. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who is called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who is free when called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. Now there's a point to be made at the very beginning of that text that I I hope is not lost on you. Um, Sometimes my fear in reading through the scriptures a little too rapidly is we miss something that's just there, just like a a blaring signal uh, for us to respond to. Consider again the words of 
Verse 17, let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him to which God has called him. Do you realize that God is laying claim to your very life, to what you do, to the choices that you make, to the decisions and course of your life, that God has the authority and right to say, I give the assignments of life. And fundamental to our, our misunderstanding, I think, of this text so often is very few Christians today, I think, even consider the, the fact, the reality that God has a right to say what I can and can't do with my life. And I say this sort of a, a conclusion at the beginning, and until you get to the point where you fully concede to the authority of God as expressed through his word, as affirmed and confirmed and taught by his Holy Spirit, that God does in fact have the right to determine and dictate the course of your life, then you will not find the true God of the Bible anywhere. And you will not live in right peace with him. And you will not find the joy that he promises as a Christian. But it will be a mass of confusion and struggle for the rest of your life until you can see, God, you are an authority over me. But let's look at some of these, uh, some of the things this text brings out. I don't want to spend too much time on things like backdrop and context today um, because I want to get to one significant point and I don't want to waste your time. But so you understand the context of what Paul's writing in chapter 7, you'll see the end of chapter 7 discussed more in your life groups. I hope you're discussing 1 Corinthians 7 in your life groups. You're talking about some of those details in that text. But there's one thing that's clear and overriding in what Paul writes in chapter 7. And Pardon me for a, a more technical theological term. Paul has certain eschatological expectations. That's what I put in your notes. In other words, Paul has a sense of the future, of end times, of what's coming next, that are really driving um, well, what he's saying and what he's writing here. In, in other words, Paul had a keen sense that we are on the cusp of the return of Christ. Now, um, Scripture doesn't validate Paul's opinion. Obviously, it, it, it didn't happen during Paul's time. We're still awaiting this return of Christ, this imminent return. But Paul was living with the expectation that Christ could then as now come at any time. And so he's, he's telling people, listen, focus your attention on things that matter. Now, this is not a principle just to be ignored simply because maybe Paul didn't clearly see when the end times were coming. It's a principle to embrace the intensity and seriousness of life to live every day as if today could be the last. For a Christian to know that Jesus could return at any moment. But Paul has certain expectations. He says in verse 26 of chapter 7, in view of the present distress, it's good for a person to remain as he is. So he tells widows, even though they're free to remarry, he says, you know, if you're, if you're a widow, stay like you are. Focus your attention on serving God and the gospel. If you're not married yet, stay like you are. That's my preference. And Paul made it clear, as we saw last week, he's expressing some things are his preference, some things that are the mind and will of Christ. Verse 29 of chapter 7, he says, the appointed time has grown very short. Verse 31, he said, the present form of this world is passing away. So Paul has this seriousness, this intensity. And that's kind of why he writes what he writes the rest of the chapter. But let's look at some lessons from the text. And there are three, two and then one really big one. Let's start with the first one. I think it's important for us to understand so we know what he's talking about here. But let me make a statement and I'll explain it. We need to know that Christianity is not culturally dependent. It's not culturally dependent. And I guess that's a way of saying Christianity is not just for a certain group of people in a certain place at a certain time. That's sort of the way the world looks at Christianity today. If you grow up in the West, then you might be exposed to Christianity. If you grew up in... The United States, you are most likely exposed to Christianity. If you grew up in the southeastern United States, well, for sure, you had some parents, grandparents, great-grandparents who were Methodists, Presbyterians, Baptists, Pentecostals, something. They went to church. But Christianity is not cultural, and that's one of the things he's teaching clearly about circumcision. Christianity is for all people in every place, every time, and every culture, to the point where Paul says something that would have been a radical statement in the first century for a Jew. Circumcision doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you are. It doesn't matter if you're not. Which is a way of saying it. It doesn't matter if you're Jewish, Hebrew by nature, or if you are something totally different than that. If you came from a pagan culture or you came from a Jewish culture, that's not the issue. Now, we know that Paul was a zealot, which means he was a, a fierce proponent of the Old Testament law. He was a Pharisee. 
a teacher of the Pharisees. We know that he taught circumcision then as a Pharisee is a necessary requirement. Think of circumcision like this. Circumcision is like the wall, the dividing wall between those who are marked as God's people and those who are not. And so Paul was a fierce advocate of it. But in light of Christ, who takes away our sins, Christ who's risen to give us new life, in light of what Christ has done for us, he says circumcision is now irrelevant. What he says in Galatians 6.15 is what counts, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. So it's telling us that the issue now is not where you were born. It's not who you are. It's not if you grew up in church or if you didn't. What counts before God is not any religious act of man. What counts before God is this, are you a new creation or not? Has God made you into something different or not? Is it still the same you struggling to be the best version of you? Or have you yielded to the supernatural work of God? who puts a new heart in us, figuratively speaking, changing the way that we think and feel, changing the desires in us, which changes the behaviors out of us. He gives us a new heart. Number two, one thing that's clear in this passage, now I, I won't spend too much time on this point, though it's an important one. We need to also understand that Christianity can thrive in any context. Christianity can and has thrived in any context. I think sometimes we're afraid in our own culture that if we don't preserve certain Christian principles, that Christianity won't survive it. You know, if we're not adamant about certain things, if, if the religious right doesn't hold sway, if, if certain things don't happen, if certain judges aren't elected, if certain people aren't chosen to office, if certain laws aren't enacted, that Christianity will wither and die. But that's never been the case. The success of the enterprise known as the kingdom of God and the body of Christ, its health, known as the church, has never been dependent upon the culture in which it exists in. It's never been dependent upon the leadership over it. It's never been dependent upon the government around it. It's never been dependent upon the beliefs of its enemies or adversaries. And nothing could be clearer than that than the context you see in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 because this is a Roman context that was not yet that pseudo-converted context uh, context of the third century, but that adamantly anti-Christian, killing all of them context of the first century. And yet it thrives. Now, why do I tell you that? Because Paul brings up something interesting here, as he does in a few other passages of Scripture. Paul addresses people who are in slavery. Now, let me make just a couple of points here just for a moment I think are critical to the text, and we can discuss these more. I'll give you my email address if you'd like. A couple of hundred years ago in our culture, people grossly misused, no, abused the Scripture, saying the Bible teaches slavery. Its critics today will still try to pull those statements out. Well, the Bible teaches slavery, so you can't believe the Bible. It endorses slavery. Well, the Bible doesn't. Scripture nowhere teaches or endorses slavery. What Scripture does is acknowledges the cultural reality that slavery existed in the time and place to which Paul is writing this letter. Do you see the difference? You see, when Paul was penning 1 Corinthians, this first letter to the Corinthians, about 20% of the people living under the Roman Empire were slaves, about 20%. And here's the beauty of what was happening. The power of the gospel was going to every quarter. I mean, it was penetrating every context. It was going into every, every people group, those at the highest levels to those who were in bondage. It was hitting them, and God was setting people free. And so this passage is not endorsing, not affirming. It's acknowledging the reality that there are people in that congregation. If you can imagine the, the disparity of one single church body, that you had rulers in it and you had slaves in it, and according to the Scriptures, in Christ there is no slave or free. There, there, there's, there's, there are no distinctions here in Christ, but we stand on an equal plane before God. It's the beauty of the gospel, and it says that in any context... Any context, the gospel can thrive. Now, Paul says something interesting here for a moment. He says, um, regarding those who are slaves, he says, don't let it trouble you. And that's a head scratcher, honestly, right? Don't let it trouble you. Why, why would Paul say such a thing to those in slavery? Whatever Paul's personal opinions were about slavery that existed, it would be a few centuries before abolition would become a, a human theme, a historical theme. 
But one cultural rea reality we know is this. The Romans were especially harsh when it came to their treatment of slaves, particularly those who would rebel. For Paul to advocate fighting for your freedom in that context would most likely have doomed them to crucifixion. Plus, if you also couple the reality that Paul is focused on your relationship with Christ and how that's supreme over your conditions, over your context, and his belief that this return could happen at any moment, it changes the equation just a little bit. But note also in verse 21, Paul was an advocate clearly for the freedom where he says, if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. Again, I want you to understand this passage is not a treatise on slavery. It's, it's, not, um, it's not a description of its horrors, whether that's a first century horror or an 18th century, 19th century American horror, but rather speaking of some bigger principles in play. Paul is talking about bigger issues even than your current physical condition. And keep this in mind for a second. If he's telling those people who are in slavery, and make no mistake about it, if you hear teaching that says, well, in the, in the first century in Rome, it wasn't so bad. It's nonsense. To be a slave is to be a slave, to be without freedom, to be without opportunity of choice, to be separated from family and friends. Surely some were treated well and some were treated heinously. Some went into slavery by choice, out of debt. Many were captured into slavery as the Roman Empire continuously expanded. Some were sold into slavery. Some were generationally enslaved. It is no minor thing, whether that's first century, as I said, or a more modern era. But if, but if you can be a Christian in that context, you tell me what context you can't be a Christian in. You, you tell me context you can't be a Christian in. Oh, you know, you know life's just not fair. You know, you know I, I would believe in God if, oh, if this happened or if God would do this for me. or you know, God, isn't, God didn't answer my prayer, so I know I don't really have the gift of mercy, but I got to tell you, man, I get tired of hearing that junk. Oh, you know, I stopped going to church because so-and-so. I, I stopped, you know, I don't, I'm not sure I believe. I'm not a Christian anymore. Don't kid yourself. People in far worse circumstances than yours people in far greater pain, people with many generations of unanswered prayers for their own freedom, no doubt, still follow Christ faithfully. Our own American history tells us that and world history tells us that. But there's some bigger principles in play here. What Paul's driving at are these things. First is your identity in Christ. Your identity in Christ. Who, who does God say that you are? How does God see you? And that's a freeing reality when you care more about how God sees you and what God says of you than you care about what anybody else says or thinks of you. you know, some of you, he says, were, you were saved, you are called to follow Christ, and you were, you were slaves. But you know what you are now? You're free in Christ. You're free in Christ, and that's so much more important. Another principle is the freedom that we have from sin and death. What does it mean to be truly free? Free from sin's penalty, free from sin's power, free to now fully, finally be able to live a life that's pleasing to God. Free. Not bound by the old sin nature anymore. Not bound by its effect on me and its consequences over me. And then, this principle, and this is the huge one, the absolute ownership of God over his people. He says, some of you were saved, you were called to salvation when you were free. And what does that make you? What does it make you when you're a free person called to faith in Christ, what have you become now? You become Christ's slave. You become a slave. Here's a question for you. Not really a trick question, but it requires more than a standard or Sunday school answer, okay? And I want you to think through it, so don't answer back because that would be awkward for all of us. But think through it carefully. What does it mean? To be a Christian. What does it mean? Now let me qualify my question. I'm really not asking you, what does it mean to you to be a Christian? But what's the biblical standard of Christian? What does it mean? What does it mean to be a Christian? For some people, Christianity is a cultural, traditional condition. Um, it's been passed down generation to generation. It's what my family's always been. 
know, my mom and dad helped build this church, or you know, my great-grandmother was so-and-so, and we passed this down as culture and tradition. And the, the net effect that has on a person looks something sort of like this. They generally try to avoid certain really bad behaviors, and they occasionally go to church. And if there's a survey to be given, they'll probably self-identify as, as Christian, because what else would they be? For some, it's political. Their Christianity is primarily political. This can be either very conservative, or it can be very liberal, or all points in between. In other words, it's about these issues that we're about. And so we press these issues or these values. And for some, being a Christian in our culture today just means they believe in God. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. In fact, I hear those two phrases said back to back so often I can't even count them. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. As if belief in God makes one a Christian. For some people, it's just a desire to be a good person. Understand there's value to the Christian ethic, the teachings of Christ give a moral framework to life. Um, so if I do this, you know, if I try to be a good person, that makes me a Christian. But when we call ourselves Christians, according to Scripture, we're proclaiming to the world that everything about us, starting with our very identity, how we see ourselves, is found in Jesus Christ. We've denied ourselves. We've died to self in order to follow him. We've been crucified with Christ. He's now Savior and Sovereign and our Lord. And everything about us centers on pleasing him. Now, the Christians of Paul's day would have understood this definition. They would have understood the sacrifice involved. They would have understood the potential cost required. They, they would have understood what the very testimony of saying publicly, I'm a Christian, might cost them. Speaking of early Christians, many of whom were martyred for their faith, John MacArthur writes this in a book I, I couldn't recommend more to you. The book is called Slave, The Hidden Truth About Your Identity in Christ. Slave. Here's something he wrote in that book. He said their self-identity had been radically redefined by the gospel. Whether slave or free in this life, they had all been set free from sin. Yet having been bought with a price, they had all become slaves of Christ. That's what it meant to be a Christian. The New Testament reflects his perspective, commanding believers to submit to Christ completely, and not just as hired servants or spiritual employees, but as those who belong wholly to him. We are told to obey him without question, follow him without complaint. Jesus Christ is our master, a fact we acknowledge every time we say, Lord. We are his slaves, called to humbly follow him, wholeheartedly obey him and honor him. We don't hear about that concept much in churches today. In contemporary Christianity, the language is anything but slave terminology. It's about success, health, wealth, prosperity, and the pursuit of happiness. We often hear that God loves people unconditionally and wants them to be all they want to be. He wants to fulfill every desire, hope, and dream. Personal ambition, personal fulfillment, personal gratification, these have all become part of the language of evangelical Christianity and part of what it means to have a, quote, personal relationship with Jesus. Instead of teaching the New Testament gospel where sinners are called to submit to Christ, the contemporary message is exactly the opposite. Jesus is here to fulfill all your wishes. Likening him to a personal assistant or a personal trainer, many churchgoers speak of a personal Savior who is eager to do their bidding and help them in their quest for self-satisfaction or individual accomplishment. The New Testament understanding of the believer's relationship with Christ could not be more opposite. He's the master and owner. We are his possession. He is the king, the Lord, and the son of God. We are his subjects and subordinates. In a word, we are his slaves. And we, we miss this word because it has been so often mistranslated in our scriptures. We've taken this word and we've rendered the very clear meaning of the word. In the, in the Greek, it's doulos which has meant and always will mean slave in this context. The original hearers would have only understood it that way. And we've greatly reduced it to servant. Servant. And really the clear meaning is the word slave. And, and while it's true that the duties of those two might overlap or intersect to some degree, there is a distinct difference. A servant was hired. A slave was owned. And the point that Paul is unapologetically making is this. You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. And God owns you. That's what it means to be a Christian. 
when we sing these songs about the cross and what Jesus did for us and what his blood did, the death of Christ on the cross and his resurrection to new life, which promises us life, when we sing about our shackles being removed and our guilt taken away and the freedom we have in Christ, what we're talking about is this. We used to be slaves to sin. Now we're slaves to God in Christ. That's the gospel. You see, the, the Bible only teaches two conditions of humanity. And they're, they're repellent to us apart from Christ, apart from understanding Christ. We're either slaves to sin, thinking that we're free to do whatever we want, but only God is ultimately free. We're constrained by our lusts, we're constrained by our broken sin natures, we're constrained by our confusion and our lack of knowledge and understanding, and we think we're free, but we're slaves to sin, and God says, I will set you free from that. And I will make you mine. You belong to me. That, that's why Paul said, I bear the marks of Christ. What was he saying? He was saying more than I've been whipped, I've been beaten, I've been nearly stoned to death. Look, you can see. He was saying, these marks show you my identity. I am marked by Christ. I'm owned by him. And because I've been owned by him, I will do anything for him. And that's the biblical definition of Christianity. MacArthur goes on to say this. He said, true Christianity is not about adding Jesus to my life. Instead, it's about devoting myself completely to him, submitting wholly to his will, seeking to please him above all else. It demands dying to self and following the master no matter the cost. In other words, to be a Christian is to be Christ's slave. So I give you this third and final point. This is what Paul is driving at. This is the heart of the passage. This is what is applicable and translatable to every one of us and will be for the rest of our lives. God has the authority and thus the right to command my life and to demand from my life whatever he will. Now here's the irony. For me to make a statement like that 1,800 years ago would not have, not have, not have caused a, a sigh, not, not have caused a raised eyebrow, would have gone off without a hitch. But today, it's just not how we see Christianity. Because we see Christianity centered around us. And God is a take it or leave it proposal. In fact, we've even, we've even divided, we've even split Christ into two identities. We, we split him, we severed him and said, uh, you, can, you can believe in him, you can accept him as savior to take away your sins. But, but later you can choose if you're gonna follow him as Lord of your life. That's not, that's not scripture. Jesus is who he is. When we say he's the king of kings and lord of lords, when we see the language of the, Old, I mean of, the, of the New Testament culminating in Revelation, the coming king, what do we think we're talking about here? You know, the Bible uses a lot of words in the New Testament to describe the followers of Christ. What do you think is the word it uses most often? What do you think is the word? It's not Christian. That word wasn't even used in the early days of the faith. You know what it is? Slave. It's the language of following Christ. It's the language of trust. It's the language of obedience. It's the language that recognizes the sovereignty of God and his goodness. Again, I said the Bible only denotes two categories of people in the world. Slaves to sin or slaves to righteousness in Christ. Paul contrasted these two groups in Romans 6. You may remember this if you were here when we were doing Romans Romans 6, verse 16, he says, Do you not know that when you present yourselves as someone as slaves for obedience, you're slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from your sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Which condition are you? You see, every person is a slave in the eyes of God, to the sin that dominates us and will ultimately destroy us or to the God who loves us and sets us free and promises everlasting life with him. And those are extreme opposites, but that's the reality. I close with this quote from a great theologian, James Montgomery Boyce. There's no such thing as absolute freedom for anyone, he said. 
No human is free to do everything he or she may want to do. There's one being in the universe who's totally free. Of course, that's God. But all others are limited by or enslaved by someone or something. As a result, the only meaningful question in this area is, who or what are you serving? Since you and I are human beings and not God, we can never be autonomous. We must either be slaves to sin or slaves of Jesus Christ. But here is the wonderful and very striking thing. To be a slave of Jesus Christ is true freedom. He's the only perfectly good master. He is the only wise counselor. He is the only perfect healer. He is the only good shepherd. He is the only one who loves us with a love so pure and undefiled that's everlasting. He is the only one worth yielding your life to. In the English Standard Version, you may have noticed that the word I'm translating slave, they translate bond servant. You know what the notion of bond servant is? A bond servant is someone who goes into slavery of their own accord. It's kind of an irony, isn't it? They willingly enter into slavery. And thus is the notion of the freedom offered to us in Christ. If you will exchange the bondage of this world, the addictions, the hang-ups, the hurts, the pains, the struggles, the disappointments, and that doesn't even include the ultimate end of sin, and you will willingly enter into a relationship with Christ as Savior and Sovereign Lord and become His bond servant. I will serve you with my life. I recognize what you did for me on the cross was not just a generic paying for sin for everybody, but the setting free from sin and its penalty for all who would come and be your servant. And I give my life to you. I'm not asking you today to ask Jesus to make your life better, to help fix some problem you're having with your life. I'm asking you to ask Jesus to do something more. Be Lord of your life. Take control of your life. To give your life to him. Give him the right that scripture affords him, which is to your good and to his glory. To live the assignment he's given. To live the life he's commanded and to be his slave. And that's the gospel. Anything less, anything less, I fear, will not save. I'm going to ask you if you bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning. I want you to spend just a few moments with some introspection, prayerful introspection. God, show me what you want me to do. Show me what I need to see. Convince me of that which is true and move my heart towards it. Will you do that right now? Will you pray and ask God? I asked you just a little earlier, uh, what is a Christian? What does it mean to be a Christian? If you're one of those who is just trying to be a good person, you're trying to apply things you read in Scripture to your life and trying to do this, I know one thing for sure, you're frustrated. And you wonder if it will ever be sufficient. And you struggle with it. I know something else, even more certainly. The Bible says by works of righteousness is no one saved. No one is saved this way. No one is saved by being a good person, doing good deeds, being the best that they can be. That affords us a sense of self-righteousness if we do it well enough and may gain us the applause of people, but it will do nothing to gain us access to God and His heaven. Maybe for some of you in this room, your Christianity is more cultural, traditional. You may be one of those people who say, you know, I've always been a Christian. Maybe there's never been a time where you've surrendered your life to Christ. Maybe you prayed a prayer that someone led you through. Maybe you understood it, maybe you didn't. Maybe you walked an aisle, maybe you were baptized, I don't know. But I don't want you to be the company of the lost who thought they were saved when they stand before God and say, oh, you're my master, master, master. No, no, you're not my servant. I don't even know you. You give your life fully to Christ. And then I imagine the different degrees just across this room, all of us who are in Christ, truly, we still struggle with this issue. 
Because we pull back the reins of control so frequently. And we buy into the ideas that, that God is at our disposal rather than we are at His. And, and maybe, we're, maybe we're afraid of what true freedom would look like or feel like. I mean, the true freedom of abandoning all the things we're trusting in except Christ and, and giving our life fully over to Him and saying, okay, God, you've got the keys now. We'll go where you want to go. God, you, you've, got, you've got the control. I'm going to love you enough to obey you and trust you, and my life is yours. Man, how freeing. How freeing would that be? What does God want you to do today? And then maybe there's just somebody in this room today that makes no claim of Christianity yet. Maybe you've never heard the claims of the gospel. Maybe even what I said today sounds a bit strange to you. But the only person in this world worth serving is Jesus Christ. And one day you're going to stand before him like all of us will. And on that day there will either be joy or everlasting regret. Joy that we use our life the right way and we gave our life to him and we were saved and transformed by him and, and we served him. That will be the everlasting joy of his servants. We enjoy him forever. The reward of his faithful servants. On the other hand, will be the pain and regret of people who live their lives for themselves apart from Christ. So listen, I'm not, ask, I'm not offering you a magic formula today that gains you access into heaven. I'm offering you what the scriptures teach is the pathway to a living and vital relationship with God where you know him and love him and honor him and serve him. And the result is joy and, and peace and everlasting life. If you don't have that today, come and Come and receive it. Come take it, what God is offering to you. Father, move our hearts today to respond to you. May we be obedient in this moment to the voice of your spirit. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.